probably 12 times that were circled, 12 separate orbits of the, of the ship during the morning. Lloyd Painter relieved Ennis, his officer of the deck. He too was reassured by the presence of the Israeli planes. I remember vividly looking out through the portholes, looking down on the O-1 level, and seeing all the officers sunbathing. And at the same time, we were being overflown, and I remember feeling very good and very warm inside that we were safe. They knew who we were. We were not a stranger out there that day. Confident that the Israelis knew who they were, the Liberty men relaxed. A new flag was flying, visibility was perfect, and they'd received no orders to leave the area. That sense of security was about to be brutally shattered. At two o'clock in the afternoon, the officers on the bridge spotted three Delta Wing Mirage jets. I saw them come at us. In fact, I was looking through the porthole when the jets came down at, 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 and leveled off on us at attack attitude. To my surprise, uh, there were red flashes under the wings and uh, missiles, rockets started hitting the ship. But the portholes were blown out instantly. Mine in my chest, the fellow next to me uh, got it in his face. And we, we all went down on the deck with the force of the concussion from the uh, glass. The next thing I heard down in my space was a panicky announcement on the loudspeaker 1MC. General Quarters, General Quarters, this is no drill. General Quarters, ship is under attack. And you hear ping, 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 ping. The decks above were being shredded. The attempts to send an SOS message failed. The Liberty's frequencies were being jammed. You'd have to know what frequencies we were going to come up on. Um, to know that, you'd have to know that we were an American ship. If you knew we were an American ship, you knew what frequencies we were going to be on because you knew what the fleet frequencies were. Duh! Hello! The attackers knew their target, but they were keeping their own identity well hidden. During the attack, uh, no one saw any markings, and some of the men uh, told me later that they made a special effort to identify them, and they swear that there were no markings, that these airplanes were unmarked. They took out all of our transmitting antennas, and shortly thereafter deposited napalm on the deck. It appeared to me that it was the intent of the at attacker to take out all communications and keep pe all people off deck so they couldn't reestablish any sort of antennas or communication system. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. The only reason we got the SOS out was because my crazy troops were climbing the antenna string in long wires while they were being shot at. At the end of the air attack, eight men were dead and 75 injured. But the worst was yet to come. We immediately uh, cast off our lines and rushed out. I at least didn't know why. The sea was very calm and then a uh, bright day. I think it was around midday, or maybe a little before that, but around midday. Uh, and only on, on the way we were told there was uh, an um, unknown vessel uh, to the south of us, or southwest uh, of us, and uh, we sped over, over in that direction. Very soon we did see a ship, a, clearly a naval vessel. The last thing I remember is the captain on the intercom system saying, stand by for a torpedo attack, starboard side. Down below the waterline, the men in the engine room got ready to die. Torpedoes coming in, it's going to open that boiler up, and you're going to die instantly. It's going to be like an atomic bomb, because that cold water, when that cold water hits that boiler, it's operating at full, uh, there's just no hope. So... All of us 19-year-olds, the best place to be is right there. You're going to get it. You're going to give it up right then and there. So torpedo attack, we waited, and they said it went by. And this went on like three different times, four different times. The torpedo is simply dropped into the water. You lose sight of it for a minute, and then you see the wake. And it was going straight for the ship, and 
we were sure that uh, our torpedo was the one that hit. It hit, and it lifted the ship right out of the water and put it down, and we started to list 10 degrees. Um, but it was a slow list, and it was going, going, going. And I said, my God, we're going to flip over. I was one of the fortunate ones. A temporary bulkhead wrapped itself around me, and the heat of the torpedo exploded all of the paint onto my skin. So I was black, but it was all superficial. Lost both eardrums, got my eyes burnt a little, but I survived. Uh, almost all of the troops within 20 feet of me were killed instantly. We uh, we just went back to work and uh, prayed that uh, this thing was not going to flip over or if it was going to go down, and uh, and and it didn't. That's about it for now. The Liberty was now paralyzed, her power and steering control lost. But her desperate SOS message had been picked up by the American 6th Fleet, 500 miles away off Crete. Retaliation was ordered for the attack. On the USS America, two bombers were readied while their fighter escort was launched. Those aircraft were, were brought forward, and I believe they were launched before we went into Condition November. Condition November meant that nuclear-armed A-4 bombers were to be used. Incredibly, the U.S. was about to launch a nuclear strike against Egypt, the Liberty's presumed attacker. Uh, one of them was taxied forward to Cat 1, and it, was, uh, it had a, like a shroud uh, around the underside of the fuselage, uh, and, and it had Marine guards uh, escorting the, uh, the A-4. So uh, that was a very unusual um, uh, experience. I've never seen anything like that. There was a flash message, as I recall, from one of the carriers that said they had launched ready aircraft. The launching of ready aircraft, you understand, that is typically nuclear-armed aircraft. Cairo was about to be incinerated. The U.S. Embassy was told that an attack was coming. Richard Parker was the political consul. There was this message that they... The Navy was uh, preparing to retaliate against Egypt for the attack on the Liberty. Uh, they thought that it was the, the, the Egyptians who attacked it. They were preparing to, uh, to attack Egypt in response. A few minutes later, Tony Hart passed a Pentagon message through to the Navy. Recalled the aircraft. My, my first thought was, as well, we don't want to do mushroom clouds. Uh, the recall probably is to rearm the aircraft. About ten minutes later, the USS America and Washington were connected by voice link. The defense secretary himself came on the line. McNamara directed Com 6 Fleet to recall the aircraft, and Com 6 Fleet said, are you sure? And he said, absolutely certain, recall the aircraft. The attack on the Liberty had triggered an extraordinary response. Nuclear-armed planes had been on their way to Cairo. A nuclear strike had been minutes away and had only just been averted. But it seems McNamara was also unwilling to send aircraft directly to help the Liberty. The fleet commander asked for permission to send a rescue flight of conventionally armed aircraft. The Admiral was talking to McNamara and asking for permission to relaunch the ready aircraft, relaunch any aircraft. And McNamara said no, that no aircraft were to be launched. Uh, McNamara is the boss, you know, he doesn't have to explain why he says what he says. Dave Lewis heard from another officer about McNamara's dealings with the 6th Fleet. I'm Admiral Larry Geis, the commander of Task Force 60. He was very upset. He said, told me he knew it was going to be hushed up, and I wasn't to say anything about it, but he had to get it off his chest. That he had sent aircraft, 